branch of my spiritual family at the New Thought Spiritual Center of Eastern Long Island. Good morning. Good morning. The God in me salutes the God in you. And I'm going to start by breaking the rules, but sorry, it is just too warm. Okay. Very excited to be here because I want to teach you that there's a power within you and it can lift your life to its highest level. It brings success, companionship, happiness, health, and peace of mind. And as you tap into this power, it will respond to you because this power is within you. And that's why I always say that spirituality rocks. And when I say that, I am talking about practical spirituality. It's taught under the guise and the denomination of new thought. It teaches that there is one ultimate loving energy in the universe that's present in all that exists. Some call this power God, spirit, infinite intelligence, divine love. Uh, lately, I've been calling it the creator of all that is. Isn't that great? The creator of all that is. Ernest Holmes, in his book, This Thing Called Life, wrote, God is life. Not some life, but all life. God is action. Not some action, but all action. God is power. Not some power, but all power. God is pure spirit filling all space. And so this Pure spirit animates our very our every act. And so then we can say that inherently we are spiritual beings having a human experience. We co-create with God. Whatever we entertain vividly enough in our surface mind eventually passes into the deeper mind and the subconscious mind. And through the law of mind, we draw and attract people, circumstances, and events which correspond to these subconscious patterns. And we live in an abundant, unlimited universe, and that within us lies all the wisdom, love, and power needed to create a joyful, prosperous life. Got it? <laughs> I always want, <laughs> I always want to, you know, people come for the first time, and I don't know if they know what New Thought teaches, so now you've got it. That's in a, <laughs> that's in a nutshell. Right? So then, we were born to bring spirit, God, or divine energy to this earthly experience in our own perfect way. We are unique and valuable creations of life. And we are here so that the divine idea of life, the divine idea of God, might fulfill itself. God seeks expression in us, through us, and as us. And so, we are here so that the divine circuitry might be complete. Okay, I thought that was very cool. The divine like, <laughs> connection, right? The connection between God and us, it's a divine circuit, right? And it's complete. So we are here to bring the metaphysical, the unformed, infinite possibility into the physical. And so by our nature, we are creative, spiritual beings. We're meant to live our life creatively because we're individual creations of God. God in us and through us and as us is us. There's a wonderful and true story of a man who lived creatively. It was in the early 1400s in Italy. The overseers of the Office of Works, uh, they were called the Operai, they had plans to commission a series of 12 large Old Testament sculptures to be placed on the buttress of the Duomo, which is the Florence Cathedral. And it was in 1410 that Donatello made the first of the statues. He made it out of terracotta, and it was Joshua. And then in 1463, Agostino di Duccio created Hercules, also out of terracotta. And then they, the operai commissioned uh, De Duccio to do another sculpture. And he worked on it for about two years, but he only got so far as beginning to shape the legs and the feet of it and, and just the torso. And then his association with the project ceased. So other artists were called in over the years to work on it, but they couldn't hack it. Pun intended. <laughs> Get it? Sculpture. <laughs> so the huge this huge block of marble just lay in the yard of this cathedral for over 25 years. And it wasn't, excuse me, <coughs> until 1501 that the operai were like so determined to find an artist that could take this large piece of marble and turn it into a finished work of art. And they ordered the block of stone, which they called the giant, to be raised on its feet so that a master artist who was experienced in this kind of work might examine it and express an opinion. And so many were consulted on this project, including Leonardo da Vinci. But it was another very young artist who was only 26 years old who convinced the church authorities to give him the commission. 
sorry. So it was on August 16th in 5001 that Michelangelo was given the official contract and he began chipping away at the marble and carved the statue out of it. It only took him two years to finish this 17 foot tall statue and in 1504 the David was complete and it was immediately recognized as a masterpiece. Now, although Michelangelo was an artistic genius with many capabilities, he was also a painter, an architect, a poet, an engineer of the high renaissance, he considered sculpting to be the highest form of art because of other reasons he m believed that it mimicked divine creation. And so as he sculpted, he worked under the premise that David was already in the block of stone, just waiting to be seen and revealed, and his job was simply to chisel well away everything that was not David. And so about this block of stone, Michelangelo said, quote, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. Yes, right? Michelangelo used his invisible power to create a work of beauty and art, and that has withstood the test of time. And like David in the stone, waited to be seen and revealed, our job then is to chip away at all those negative thought patterns, all those limiting beliefs that are in our subconscious mind that don't allow the natural and full expression of our divine creativity. We are all creative, and at our core is pure potentiality. New Thought author Eric Butterworth, he wrote this book, Discover the Power Within, fabulous book. If you've not read it, I encourage you to check it out. And he said, quote, the life that urges us to create can never be concealed or shut away forever. He said, ever present, it simply awaits our recognition and expression. From God flows all creation, all that exists. Since we are one with God, inseparable from God, then we are by our nature creative, and that means extravagantly so. Don't you like that word, extravagant? <laughs> For just as life is limitless, so are our capacities to imagine and thus to create. Creativity is an endless river of mind, and each is a stream flowing into and out of that river. So here's our affirmation. By my nature, I'm extravagantly creative. Say it. By my nature, I'm extravagantly created. And I feel motivated and inspired. By my nature, I'm extravagantly creative. And I feel motivated and inspired. You know, we're all gifted artists, each and every one of us. I've seen people who are creative in one area, very, very creative, who lack a belief in their ability to be creative in other areas in their life, which kind of was me, by the way. I just totally, absolutely, you're going to find this hard to believe, knocked my socks off. I was thinking, you know, I've got to give this talk on creativity, so come on, universe, you've got to tell me what to teach to people. And so I, I took a dress and I sewed it. I got this idea to dart it and tack it. I was like, oh, great, I'm creative. I can sew. Oh, I'm a boat captain. I'm creative. And what else can I do? Um, uh, oh, okay, I'm good with colors. I can dress with colors. And that was about it. <laughs> I'm like, jingo, netties. And then I start doing that thing where you compare yourself to everybody else. Because most of my friends are musicians, and of course musicians are very creative, and artists are very creative. All these people are creative, and I'm thinking, jingo, netties. I'm this person who out there teaches all the time, and I'm not even creative. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. I guess for someone who writes inspirational talks, that's pretty creative. <laughs> I know, isn't that crazy how that dawned on me? Isn't it amazing how something can be right in front of your face? And then until you embrace it, and when I embrace it, I have to tell you, my self-awareness increased in such a wonderful way. But there are so many blocks to our creativity. And the truth is, every day, we can bring experience, imagination, originality, and potential. But we have to accept that we are meant to live creatively. And so there are mental blocks, like I just said. I had a mental block I, didn't even, I wasn't even aware. But the biggest block is that we're not brought up to understand that we're one with God, a divine creative being. Another block is that because we're highly social creatures, and even the thought that a complete stranger might ridicule us is enough to make many of us not even attempt to do something creative. We're like, I ain't going there, you know? And you know, because we don't want to be diminished. And some blocks come from our past and program into us from an early age. We are taught 
uh, you know, to follow the rules, be logical, don't paint outside the lines in our calling books, we're, we're taught to conform, or I don't know about you, remember you're a little kid, you're in uh, kindergarten, and you know, you're drawing, and you're drawing, and I look over and I see the kid next to me, I'm drawing stick figures with stringy hair, and the kid next to me is this great artist, and so right there, I decided, because I compared, that I wasn't an artist which is simply not the truth, but this is what happens. And then this is what goes in the subconscious mind. And some of us live in closure. Closure is a state of mind where the doors of their mind are literally closed. New ideas, we ignore them. The universe is constantly giving us divine ideas. It's one of our direct inheritances of God. The other is love. And we have these ideas, we ignore them, or we criticize them, or we push them away. I remember I told it here one time, I used to be before, 28 years ago, before that, when I was like one or something, I was, um, I was an eyewear stylist. I could look at you, go on the rack, pick a pair of glasses, and you'd just buy them. And these people, they had these really clunky sports glasses, and, I, and they were horrible, horrible if you played sports. Somebody hit you, your nose. So I had this idea to make these glasses, bubble glasses. They're very cool, I had a vision, it was great and everything, but I wasn't a new thought yet. And I said, how am I going to do it? I don't have the math skills. How am I going to figure this out? Like, and don't you know, six months later, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had on my glasses. Why? Because if you don't take that idea, it's going to go back into the universal mind. There's one mind common all, so somebody else is going to take your idea. So you better take that idea and, 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 and take it and, and create it. So if we believe we're not created, creative, we might also believe that, oh, I need a skill that's beyond my capability. That's another way we block our creativity. Eric Butterworth, I was into Eric Butterworth this week. He wrote, the life that urges us to create can never be concealed or shut away forever, ever present. It simply awaits our recognition and expression. Thus the affirmation, by my nature, I'm extravagantly creative. By my nature, I'm extravagantly creative. I feel motivated and inspired. I feel motivated and inspired. So God is always urging us and nudging us from within to express our creativity. And on occasion, our innate creativity, our inner desire, our, 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 to express our imagination, our originality, it can show up disguised. And it can be so disguised that we can misinterpret it for something completely different than what it is. It can show up as unhappiness, it can show up as frustration with life or ourselves or with others. It can show up with block circumstances or somewhere in our life that it just doesn't seem to be working. It can show up with an, just an unsettled feeling that something's just not right. And you know what? is probably absolutely is nothing wrong at all. It may just be that we're not expressing our creativity to the level that our God self, that our divine self desires for it to be expect, expressed. And so in spiritual vernacular, spiritual jargon, we call this divine discontent. And it concurs whenever we're not allowing or honoring our divine gifts or our divine nature to be expressed. And so this thing, that we call divine discontent is really the universe tapping us on the shoulder and saying, hey, I want you to be a greater expression of me. It's tapping on the shoulder, hey, say, excuse me, it's time for you to sprout wings and fly like a butterfly. Butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> At least I listen to myself when I talk. It's so, it's the universe like pushing at you from within and saying, I want you to express more of the unique talents and gifts that you've had hidden within you. Or the universe is saying there's a situation in the world of human experience that could use your creative inner genius. Don't block it. Allow it to unfold. And so underneath this divine discontent is the divine urge to have a new, original, imaginative way to look at something new or a new imaginative way to express yourself. Ernest Holmes, in his book, Science of Mind, wrote, page 222, there is an urge to express life in all people. And this urge, operating through the channels of creative mind, releases energy into action, and it compels the individual to do something. And so back of all this desire is the impulse to express our divinity. 
And so this week, you know what I did? I was thinking, how can I be more creative? And I was thinking of someone I knew who was creative. I thought of you. And I decided to try planting. And it's not as easy as digging a hole and sticking the plant. I'm just telling you. <laughs> For those of you who are gardeners think it's that easy, it's not that easy. But I'm, so I, this is the way that I've made a conscious choice. And so I'm trusting that the universe is going to bring me whatever I need because it's an inner urge that's desiring to express through the creative channels of mine. It's an impulse for my divinity to be expressed. So then, divine discontent then can be an impetus for healing. Divine discontent can be an impetus for growth. It can be an impetus for transformation or discovery or creativity for expression for solutions to problems. So I said, well, I better tell the people a couple of examples of how uh, in certain situations people use the divine discontent to propel divine creativity. <clears throat> there was a large Midwestern city and there were a gang of thieves they had worked out such a coordinated routine for that was so smooth and fast that they could break into a store and rip it off like that they would just sweep the clothing off the racks be gone for, before the police could even catch them then a detective got an idea and the idea he asked all the clothing merchants to put one hanger facing the did i just say hanger one hanger facing the wall that way the next one facing the wall this way the next one facing all, you got you, you with me? So one towards the wall, one away. One towards the wall, one all the way. So then the next time that there was a, a robbery, when the police answered the alarm, they found the thieves very frustrated taking one item off the rack at a time. So you see, divine, see the impetus, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So here's a creative solution, and I, I like this one. I actually kind of think it's kind of funny. A farmer was having trouble <clears throat> keeping hunters off his property. His no trespassing and no hunting signs were destroyed and his warning signs that said, uh, stay out of here or get shot, somebody had shot them up. So, <laughs> I know, I thought it was funny too. And so, nothing worked. And so finally he got creative in his thinking and he got a sign that said, rattlesnake sanctuary. <laughs> so no more hunters came on his property. But it was the divine discontent with the situation that called for new creative ways of thinking. Many people mistakenly think that creativity is only found in certain aspects. It is not true. You can be creative in anything you do. And please remember that underneath the feelings of divine discontent is the divine urge to have a greater expression of ourselves, a new, original, imaginative way to look at something. Divine discontent is merely God trying to get our attention. It is our authentic self nudging us to express our unique talents and gifts. Please repeat after me. By my nature, I am extravagantly creative. I feel motivated and inspired. I made that into a jingle, which I have to sing apparently really quick, and it goes like this. By my nature, I'm extravagantly creative, and I feel motivated and inspired. By my nature, I'm extravagantly creative, and I feel motivated and inspired. One more time. By my nature, I'm extravagantly creative, and I feel motivated and inspired. And see, we got the validation. What was that? Okay. We are, we are born to bring spirit, God, divine energy to this earthly experience in our own perfect way. To bring the unformed, the infinite possibilities into the physical so that the divine idea of life itself that is seeking fulfillment through you can be expressed. We are here so that the divine circuitry may be complete. It is our destiny to demonstrate the potentiality which is inherent in each of us. We are always in an ex evolutionary growth cycle, which means that no matter how great our lives have been to this point, no matter how available we are to experience the fullness of God as our being, there is always more. Life is an upward spiral. Life wants you to have greater expression, greater peace, greater joy, greater health, greater wisdom, greater love, greater prosperity, greater possibilities yet to explore. And our job is to go out there and to live it and glorify the 
this power because by my nature, I am extravagantly creative and I feel motivated and inspired. Woo! Thank you. Love you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron.